Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet, powered by Revolution, the one we have where we have the greatest guests and most powerful conversations. And today is no different. Today we have a very special guest on the show with us today, very long awaited and anticipated. We have the psychologist, author, poet, and speaker, Dr. Tama, on the show with us today. How are you doing today, family? I am doing wonderful. So glad to be with you. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Like I said, we've been trying to make this happen for uh, several months now. So I really appreciate you um, just making this happen and, and, and doing this and just taking out a few moments to share some time with our audience. So this is very greatly appreciated. And I'm honored to have you on. Oh, uh, well, I appreciate the invitation and thank you for your patience. I'm so glad the window opened up for us to have the conversation. Um, it, it's a lot of questions that I uh, wanted to um, that I have for our conversation today, but I wanted to start off. Um, I spent a lot of yesterday and this morning uh, going back and forth over your uh, Morehouse induction speech that you had gave. Yes. And, um, I remember it was a statement that you had started off with in the beginning. Um, and you were talking about how you thought you came here for an induction speech and you actually came here for a therapy session. Yes. But you started it off with like a spiritual and I wanted to ask you, is that somewhat similar to how your therapy sessions start off with something of, of a spiritual nature? And why is that important? If so, to like yes. something spiritual into therapy? Certainly. So I usually start my uh, sessions with a moment of meditation, just inviting people to take breath. I think so many of us have a lot on our plates. So we are juggling and holding a lot of roles and responsibilities. And so when it comes to our healing, giving ourselves permission to slow down, to be present, uh, to not multitask, but to fully show up for ourselves. And so a part of the way we do that is with the breath and paying attention uh, to our bodies. Because we can hold our bodies so tightly, we can neglect ourselves and overlook our own needs. And so that idea of homecoming, coming home to yourself uh, for your healing and for life is so important. And then in terms of the spiritual aspect, I have found, especially when working uh, with Black clients, that as a community, we endorse high levels of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And a lot of mental health professionals have not been trained uh, or taught about how to integrate the spiritual. And so then you're talking about a spiritual people working on their healing while neglecting the sacred, which is just uh, nonsense. So we're holistic beings. And I'd like to let people know that their full self is welcomed in the space and that includes our spirituality. And, and what do you uh, feel like is the importance of breathing? Because I hear a lot of people talk about breathing and just releasing the tension in the body. Is it um, is it like an actual thing that ten certain tensions in your body or certain muscles in your body become tense based on the specific trauma that you're dealing with? Because um, I was talking to a gentleman the other day and he was telling me uh, somewhat similar, like depending on what like part of your body is tense, he can tell like what you're like stressing about. Yeah. So the reality is that stress shows up in our nervous system. So we often think about stress uh, and our thoughts. So we're considering our cognitions or our minds or our worries, but the stress affects your whole body. When you're stressed, you might have your heart rate increasing. Uh, you might start sweating you might hold your back tight or a lot of us have backache uh, or insomnia or migraines or nausea because the body is telling the story, right? The body is holding, even when we keep things a secret, some things we don't talk about with people, but the body is communicating that this is causing me stress. So when I slow down and intentionally take breath, I am letting my nervous system know it's okay, right? Because a lot of us are living in survival mode where we are waiting for somebody to disrespect us, waiting for somebody to look at us wrong. Because that whole idea of like, don't let them catch you slipping, right? So that hypervigilance is one thing if you're really in danger in the moment for the body to rally. Some of us live like that, like are perpetually guarded 
And the body has actually not been created to sustain that level of stress. And so, especially if you either grew up with a lot of drama in your household or in your neighborhood or in your school, then there was this feeling of having to always be on. And so in order for us to heal, we have to have some experience of ease, some experience where I can actually breathe. So when I slow down my breathing, I am nourishing my body. It's like a hug to my body of saying, you're okay, we're okay, I got you. And that message helps us to relax and we actually do better when we're in a relaxed state. When you're stressed, I think all of us can admit we made some bad decisions when we were stressed out. You know, it's like when you're panicked and you're just like creating more confusion because you couldn't think clearly. So for us to do our best in life, uh, we want to have some sense of uh, comfort, some sense of safety, some sense that we are grounded or rooted within ourselves. And I wanted to ask you, um, ask you about something just about um, being able to actually make progress in constantly going back into those similar environments like um Working with children, I, I have conversations about this with, with, with a lot of people. Um, how do you make actual progress with working with somebody who is in an environment that they didn't choose? So they're trying to make progress, but they keep going back to the same trauma. Like it's different with adults because okay. we, can, in somewhat of a way, we can kind of curate our environment, choose our environment. But with a child, if they're dealing with an environment that they don't choose and you're giving them tools and steps how can they make progress um, when they're returning to an environment that's constantly triggering them? So important. I'm so glad you named that. So there are different approaches to psychology, and one of them is called liberation psychology. And it is that reminder that we need to pay attention to the context instead of, you know, sometimes we are blaming individuals for the ways they are surviving a toxic environment, right? So the way people are functioning or carrying themselves may be what allowed them to survive some very terrible situations. Mm. And so we, we have to pay attention to that. And so one of the things I learned early as a therapist, as a psychologist, when working with children was the importance of family therapy. Because if not, it's like you're saying, I could talk to this kid for an hour and I'm giving them all kind of affirmation and encouragement. And then the parent picks them up and is like cussing them out in the parking lot, hitting them upside the head. So it's like everything I just did in that hour is gone. And it is important that uh, parents and uh, grandparents and aunties and teachers recognize the, the huge role that we play in children's lives. And so even if that steady person does not end up being your biological parent, if you have some stable, caring adults in your life, it can really help the child to survive that season and also to shift and outlast it. Hmm. And I wanted to ask you about something that you touched on as well, because it, it, it's, it's really important to me as well about just being able to live outlive a habit um, when it basically helps you survive and it's not helping you thrive. Like, how do you know when a habit is like it's it's outlived its usefulness. And it's like, okay, well, this helped me through a, see, cause you talked about it in your speech as well. Um, just about inter like being independent and how it yeah. normally comes from disappointment. Um, how do you know when like a certain habit protected you through a period of pain, but now it's time to thrive. So you got to let it go. Right. Absolutely. So you think about what are my goals for myself in this season and are there any ways that I am sabotaging myself, mm. right? So some people in their environment learn not to trust anybody because they kept getting hurt, they kept getting betrayed, but they're in a season in their life where they actually would like companionship. Mm. But whenever people approach them because of those trust issues, they're combative, they're aggressive, they uh, do the silent treatment or they go disappearing. They're ghosting people, but they're hoping the per people will keep calling. So it's like you are standing on your own wings. So to be able to recognize when am I blocking my own shot? So I need to learn how to do it differently because the way I learned helped me to navigate a certain way. 
but it's not how I want to live. Another example that comes to mind is uh, I was on a panel and someone was sharing that their story is not a, a popular story, but uh, they dealt with housing insecurity and they said what helped them with the suicidal thoughts was actually their addiction. So they would drink a lot or be high and, and being in that altered state made them not take their life, but it also created a whole nother set of problems. So then they had to figure out how can I uh, heal the suicidal thoughts and be sober at the same time, right? Because sometimes the thing we're doing to soothe us is also sabotaging us. If it's not, you know, um, excessive alcohol or drugs, it might be for a lot of people, emotional eating, right? So people are lonely at midnight. So then they think they're hungry, right? It's, cool. it's like, go to bed. <laughs> but instead of going to sleep, now, you know, we're opening a bag of chips. Now we're eating a pint of ice cream, trying to soothe the loneliness, but it also is, is creating its own issues. And, and that's so deep because it makes me think about how like certain vices or certain things can be like even used in great moments. You know what I'm saying? Like it could be something as simple as you're drinking when you're sad, but now you've trained yourself to drink when you make an achievement. So you achieved a big sales week. So now you're drinking. So now even when you're not upset, yes. you're drinking when you're happy now. So it's a trigger when you're happy. It's a trigger when you're sad. And it's just like, wow, it's, it, you're burning the end on both candles and, and it's really powerful. I wanted to ask you, like, what is um, a step that we can take to move forward into breaking a bad vice? Like, does it have to be something that's somewhat similar to the vice that you had? Like if the vice was drinking, they could be drinking something different or it doesn't matter if it's in the similar like area. Right. It can be totally different. It's just looking for another way of coping. Uh, another way of, and a part of it may also be acknowledging what you're really feeling because some of us run from our feelings. So we're using these other things, hooking up with random people, overworking uh, to distract ourselves. And so uh, it may be for some people, instead of having another activity, learning how to actually feel your feelings without uh, being overwhelmed by them or fearing them, right? So it's like, instead of, okay, before I would, you know, do these random hookups. Now, instead, I'm going to get on a treadmill. Well, you still haven't really sat with the fact that you're grieving. So like, let the grief come. Mm. And uh, you no, know, it's like a tide. Those emotions will rise. And we beat, breathe through it. You might journal through it. You might talk to somebody through it. And then they will uh, decrease. So uh, I would encourage us to not just look for a new way to run from it, um, but to also face it. Are there any common vices that you find that people don't maybe see as vices? Like you just said, overworking, like. I know a lot yes. of people hearing that would be like, that's, that's not a like that. That's, that's good stuff. Like I'll just work hard. I work a lot, you know, right. Like, what are some things that people might not see as a vice that can be used to like escape, you know? Reality? Yes. And that overworking, uh, it can cost us our relationships. Mm -hmm. It can cost us our health. Sometimes we are chasing something and then we get it and it's not even as fulfilling as we thought of what, you know, what we thought it would mean or, uh, how we thought people would see us. And so uh, it's hard for some people to believe, but there are people with titles and money who are very empty. Mm. So getting clarity about what is it you actually desire, right? What would actually give you fulfillment? The other thing is when I'm constantly running like that, I'm actually not healed, right? Mm. So busy is not the same thing as healed. And people can think that you must be fine because you're functioning. Uh, but if they saw you at midnight, they may think something else, uh, that the, the, the woundedness uh, shows up in different ways. It can show up in, us, in our parenting. We might be super harsh or we might be checked out. It may show up in our romantic relationships. It may show up in how we manage or don't manage our money. It may show up in our homes uh, with clutter. 
right? So super productive, but like living in mess. And so it's like, what is the message I am telling myself about my own worthiness? Uh, So not only is busyness one that's often overlooked, uh, people often also overlook if you are a, a people pleaser. And that's an unhealthy coping strategy, but people love it, right? Other people love it because you ignore yourself you deny your own needs and you look out for everybody else. So like who wouldn't love a friend like that, a family member like that, a partner like that. Um, But it is neglecting yourself as you are doing that. And so learning that you are worthy of the care you're so desperately seeking to give other people. You feel like caregivers can have a similar thing like you're trying to fix other people's problems so you don't have to fix your own like it's uh, that very much people can avoid their own issues by focusing on everybody else's so it is very important uh that you have support right that each of us have support so for example as a psychologist when i'm meeting with other people that's and during that session i'm focused on them but i have to have areas in my life, relationship in my life, where I focus on myself else I'm, or else I am just perpetually avoiding myself. So I would say for mental health professionals, for nurses, doctors, uh, care providers, uh, ministers, social workers, uh, it's really important that you not neglect yourself. And how do you go about like um, setting those similar boundaries? I had a conversation, um, I think it was about like two days ago um, on my other podcast. And uh, we were having a conversation about setting boundaries in the middle of a relationship. It could be any type of relationship with your mom, dad, you know, uh, friends, uh, you know, romantic relationship. But how do you effectively establish um, a boundary in a relationship when there's already been like subtle agreements, like this is our kind of our pattern, but I'm breaking into the pattern because it's no longer healthy for me. But yes. sometimes it can feel like this has everything to do with you and nothing to do with me because mm. this is what I've been used to doing for you. But it's like, I can no longer do this because this doesn't work for me anymore. So I feel I, like boundaries that you come in with are more acceptable than boundaries that you make in the middle of a relationship. So how do we like yeah. go about like making boundaries in the middle of something that we've already subtly agreed on, like unconscious. Yes. Uh, the communication is so important because the reality is we grow and change. Sometimes we grow and change together. Sometimes we grow apart. Mm. So people may have selected you, chosen you because you were a people pleaser. And then now you've been doing that for a while and you're tired and realizing I want some care too. And they're like, what is this? <laughs> right? Like you can't switch up. Well, that's human nature. We, we grow and we change. So it will be important to communicate those changes and then uh, to be aware that the person may accept the change or not. And then you have to be willing to decide what am I going to do if they are unwilling to follow the new guidelines, right? Uh And some people will, and they'll grow with you. And this is the painful part of healing that a lot of people don't tell you is not everybody will like you whole, Mm. right? Some people like, some people were drawn to you because you had low self-esteem because they could run the show and tell you to do whatever they wanted you to do. And then something happened. You went to therapy or you had some breakthrough and uh, you have a better sense of yourself mm. and there will be friends who will celebrate like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm so glad you're like coming into yourself. And then there are some people who will say you changed and they don't like it. So when you are when you have had an awakening, it is very hard to go back to sleep. Mm. So people will have to adjust to the new you. And if they don't, you may have to make some difficult choices. That homecoming is something different. Yeah. Yes. That homecoming is something different. It makes yes. me think about when I hear um, just 
the more awareness that we have, the more like sensitive we get to to subtle things because we're more like we're more aware of our worth. We're more aware of how things should be, how things yes, what we deserve, you know. And that's right. It kind of feels like it gets more painful, just kind of how similar to what people describe with consciousness, like the more conscious you get, the more stressed out. But it's really not. It's just the more you're aware of what you're not supposed to do, what you're not supposed to eat, where you're not supposed to go. And it's just like I think it just comes into, like you said, that wholeness that like mm-hmm. this wholeness feels like because sometimes we think doing the right thing always feels good. You know, yeah. and just like I, I love how you describe that, like, you know, just because you're coming into your wholeness doesn't mean people are going to accept you. And it's like, oh, this is mm-hmm. the. It might come with different pains that you've never thought of, you know, yes. mostly it's external. So, yes. And I want to name the discomfort and awkwardness, even for the person themselves. You know, let's say it's your relationship with a family member and it like never even occurred to you to disagree with them, to challenge them or to tell them no. And so it's understandable that you will feel nervous, right? Of I love this person. I respect this person. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. So sometimes in therapy, people even practice role playing uh, where and and I will give them different ways the person might respond. Right. Because sometimes people get thrown off because you make some announcement about your change and think everybody's going to roll with it. And then, you know, that might not be the answer you get. So then what would you like to say? I also wanted to um, kind of double back to uh, the induction speech that you gave in Morehouse because you you, you made a statement and it was really powerful. Um, and it had me thinking because it, it's like a deep thought. You, you talked about uh, this concept of global therapy, like how we all need a global therapy session. And I'm like, OK, I, I, I wouldn't want to know, like, what would that even look like? Because it made me think. Do we have do you have therapy sessions with someone who could be considered an abuser or somebody who's the abused and have them in the same room. And how would you conduct that? Or is that even how it should be seen? Like, like, because if we talk about it on a global scale or even a national scale, it's like, it's so many hidden truths that I feel like us as a global community, us as a national community, us, however you want to quantify it, what we have to tell to each other because we've been hurt by one another and we've hurt each other several times. So how do we have this conversation? Like, does it start off with truth? Does it start off with establishing each other's boundaries? Like how how would that conversation even happen? Because it's something that we've been talking, like we need to come to the table and all and like talk about this. Yes. So it is very important um, that as a rule, for example, we don't provide couples therapy for a couple where there is current domestic violence Mm. because it's just not safe, right? Mm. If they're meeting with us and the person who's being victimized says something the other person doesn't like or tells us something they weren't supposed to say, and then they get in trouble, get harmed when they get home for speaking truth, right? Mm. So uh, in those cases, we talk about uh, individual or separate therapy or also group therapy. So you may be in a group with other survivors, or if you have offended, then you're in a group with people who have also offended. Um, and so that work is really important. When we talk about, let's say, an adult child who now wants to go back and confront someone who harmed them when they were uh, younger, then I talk about the importance of getting clear about your intentions for the meeting Mm. and the confrontation. Because if if the person doesn't admit it and apologize, if it will devastate and dismantle you, then you're not ready for the confrontation because you're needing them to respond in a particular way that we cannot guarantee, right? But if I'm in a place where whether you deny it or not, whether you try to make jokes about it or not, whether you try to justify it or not, I need you to know that I know what you did and that that was wrong, right? So you can say whatever you want to say, but I need to say my piece. Mm -hmm. Then I'm in a place where I can do that. And then the person can respond however they want to respond, but I needed to speak my truth regardless, right? And, you know, when I think about those who have harmed, it is also important to know not, this is not 
uh, excuse making, but is holding the complexity as many people who have harmed have also been harmed. And so as the counselor, I have to see them in their fullness, right? So attending to the harms they have experienced as well as the harms they have committed and one does not erase the other. And, and it, it, it just makes me think like, and I, I like the way you broke that down because I, I had, I'm like, okay, so it just lets you understand that there's a sense of wholeness that needs to take place or maybe just like a sense of like knowing that needs to be had before you can have the conversation. Because some conversations, it's like you said, I need a specific apology. I need a specific answer. I need a specific explanation. And like you said, it could do more damage than good. Mm-hmm. Not getting exactly. Right. What you mean. And It's true. And sometimes uh, people don't even know themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes let's say when we're dealing with issues of infidelity, right? Sometimes the person who was cheated on wants to know why. And it's not any really good why that like nothing they say is going to make you say, oh, okay, I get it. Mm. (laughs) You know, thanks for letting me know, right? So sometimes we are wanting uh, a reason for an act that did not have logic to it, right? It was like it was available. And I didn't think I would get caught. (laughs) So that's what I did. And that can feel very incomplete for someone who's needing a more, more, a deeper answer. That's deep. Because sometimes I'd be telling people the what isn't important, but the why is more important. But sometimes there's really not a deep. Sometimes the why is on some foolishness of like, The what is deeper than the why is like... (laughs) What I did is deeper than my thought process behind it. Right. It's crazy. That that yeah. that that's deep. That's deep. I wanted yeah. to also ask you about um just trying to break the ice or just trying to um kind of get people to express themselves and 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 let you know where they're at that day. You know, just asking somebody, how are you feeling? You know, I hear a lot of people say, like, we get automatic responses of just like, right. I'm doing good. You know, that's the automatic response, especially if you just send somebody out and you're just like, Hey, how you doing? And then I'm doing good. That's the automatic response. Mm-hmm. But if you want something a little bit deeper and you want to go beneath the surface or really be there to hold space for like a good friend or somebody that you're um, really just trying to make sure and check in and that they're doing good, like how can you, or just check in to see how they're doing. Mm-hmm. What is a better question to ask than like, or or a more effective, right. let me say more effective, not better, more yeah. effective question to ask than how are you doing? Mm-hmm. So you can ask, uh, how have you been managing? What's been helping you to deal with life these days? Hmm. Right. So there, I see your light bulbs going. <laughs> I like, see so you can't give me a fine. You oh. know, how have I been managing? You know, and some people give you like the I do the best I can. So how has that been? You're doing the best you can. Because a part of it is slowing down uh, because we have to give people the signal that I'm asking a real question. Mm. Right. Because sometimes people give you a short answer because they don't think you really care anyway, that you're just, you know, doing the script. What's up? What's up with you? Nothing, nothing. Keep it moving. Right. Like some people don't want to know how you're doing. (laughs) So when I slow down with my pace, with my eye contact, with my question, I'm signaling that I'm actually uh, concerned, Mm. that I actually care. And another way that can open that door is by my own sharing. Right. Mm. Transparency can help a lot of people get transparent. But if we're all pretending I'm marvelous, I'm great, I'm blessed, I'm wonderful, right? Then we go all keep it right there. But Mm -hmm. if you just need like one person in the circle to say something real Mm -hmm. and then people will like tap in. Mm -hmm. And and I like how you put that, because I think incorporating the word good kind of gives a baseline for like, it's like subtle things in our mind. Like just you saying good, you expect me to be good, like. Yes. You said, Are you good? Like good makes right, it right. for this conversation. But you said manage, like already addressing the stresses that are in everybody's life because everybody yes. has stress in their life. And it's that's just, right. Like, using that word kind of just like, OK, well, it's a different baseline now. Right. And I like that. Right. It just, it yeah. Really yes. Stressing people's lives. I, mm-hmm. I um, And I, I wanted to ask you about um, 
just the concept of being able, because you, you had this powerful statement, you said, um, saying all I need is Jesus is a trauma response, or all I need is God is a trauma response, talking about, you know, just being independent. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about, like, how can we get out of that independent mindset into in a more of unity mindset? You know, being mm-hmm. able to, or is it a time for, like, group therapy or like is it a stage that you might not be into to like come to a larger community and what do you do when you're in that stage of not being able to come to a larger community like is yeah. there like a smaller uh individual like mm-hmm. type of thing that you can tap in with outside of therapy if they're not ready for it right yes absolutely so it's important for us to know a part of our healing only takes place in relationship to other people hmm Right. So a lot of us will do like introspection, which is good. Journaling, sitting and thinking about things, going for a walk. All of that is good. Uh, And we are relational beings. And that doesn't have to be romantic relationship, but it's just in connection or in community to other people that uh, my ability to express myself and still feel seen and heard and acceptable to others is healing Uh, because a lot of us also along with distrust a lot of people carry shame Mm. and so the reason we may be avoiding people is I don't want people to actually know me right because if they really knew me maybe they wouldn't think I'm good (laughs) so it is healing to discover there are people who can know me and still love me. And you talk about this concept a lot of um, shrinking, like shrinking down, shrinking back into your childhood. What do you find is the most common thing that causes people to shrink back to their childhood? Is it like um, confrontation, people raising their voice or like feeling a sense of powerless? Or maybe is it different depending on like your childhood? Right. Yeah, uh, fear. Hmm. You know, fear of of rejection, fear of uh, not being good enough, insecurity, uh, fear of being targeted. Some people actually uh, know they have capabilities, but they have either learned from their own experience or watching others that when you excel, some people will attack you. So Mm. they're hiding in the background to be safe. Hmm. Right. Living as a fraction of themselves, because like who wants all that attention? So uh, looking at what is it that is uh, that I am anxious about Hmm. and can I imagine that experience happening and me outlasting it? Right. So like, let's say I'm afraid of public speaking because what if I forget my lines? Okay. And what, you either going to start talking about something else or you're going to stand there till you remember or you're going to check your notes or you're going to go sit down and then life will go on. Right. So uh, us being able to face our fears and risk connection, risk being known. That's deep. That's deep. And and. <laughs> I, I, I like that continued point of just like being whole in like what that looks like, because we all know what it looks like to live a life like a character, or like live the life as a conformist or, you know, do the different things yeah. that you know work. But it's just like. Being rejected as a character is different than being rejected as yourself, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes we play the character and we've been rejected. Yeah character and it doesn't hurt quite as bad because like yeah I know that I didn't really quite show Mm -hmm. so so that's cool you know they didn't kind of send me but if I would have said I was into this movie and they didn't like that that would have hurt me a little bit more that would have stung me a little bit more I said I like this that would have stung me a lot more like it's just um, it's just right no that's a good point Um, that's also why some people don't try their best Mm. right because then if it doesn't work it's like I didn't care anyway or I didn't really do my best but when you prepare and practice and try and put your all into it, yes, it, it hurts. I wanted to ask you a question. It just hit me because I, um, I have this thing ever since I was probably in like middle school. I would have this reoccurring dream of being the last person to take the test. And even after college, I have this reoccurring dream that I'm still taking tests and like 
it's not even it's about failing it, but it's it's also about being the last person taking yes. it. Like in a dream, I'm always the last per- person taking the test. Yeah. And even when I was in school, I was trying to like be like one of the first people to finish it. Not mm-hmm. because of me wanting to get a certain type of grade. It's just mm-hmm. I never wanted to be the last person to finish the test. It just it just felt wrong to me. And, you know, mm-hmm. like felt like something was wrong. I, I don't know what that's about. And I, I just wanted to yeah. like see if that like had like some deeper resonant with you. Cause I'm just like, I'm, tr- I've been trying to figure out what that meant for quite some time. Yeah. Thank Can you. you remember, uh, how the class responded to the person who was last? Mm. Upset, upset, like, man, come on, hurry up and finish so we can like all talk again. Like, you know, the whole yes. class is yes. quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. You're holding us up. So mm. people are angry with you. So you don't want to be the target of their anger. Jesus. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, and that shows up in life. Mm. Right. I don't want people to be mad at me. I don't want to be the one holding up what could be. I don't. Here it is. I don't want to be a disappointment. Hmm. Hmm. And the beautiful part is when you're in the right community, in the right relationship, even if you take longer, people will have grace and patience and acceptance and uh, you won't be rejected for the things that you needed more time to accomplish. Ashe, I'm like, wow. Ashe. I feel that. I wanted to ask you as well uh, about like feeling defeated by life. You know, I feel like sometimes we can try to motivate or like get people out of a rut sometimes and they're kind of stuck in it. You know, um, what would you say is the most effective way to help somebody who's stuck in a rut who constantly in the same rut? And like we mm-hmm. might go through the process of like sympathizing and being in the rut with you. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. comes to a point where it's like, I don't know, maybe it's, see, because I'm not a therapist. So it's like, maybe it's kind of annoying me in a way, like mm-hmm. we're sitting in it for a long time. Let's get to the solution. Cause I want to help you. Cause like, mm-hmm. this is coming, it feels like it's becoming my problem too, because mm-hmm. I'm constantly revisiting it with you. Yeah. How can, what is a, 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 a way of love, a, a loving way to go about like helping somebody out of something that seems like it's a repeating cycle in their life, or is it yeah. just about being patient for their process? Yeah. Well, One, I want to make the connection with what we were just talking about, right? Because before it was you afraid of being last and now you're dealing with a friend who's last. Mm. (laughs) Right? Mm. Yeah. So when my friend is not a friend or family member or partner is not launching, when I'm seeing better for them than they are possibly seeing for themselves, then... It in part may be, do they want the thing I want for them? Mm. Wow. Right. Because sometimes we're like, yeah, let's go back and start this business or let's go back to school or let's do whatever it is. And that's your dream. That might not be their dream. Mm. So I need to check in. Have I been trying to dream for both of us? And they actually like their life right now. Mm. Right. It was, you know, it takes me back to an interesting conversation I was having with somebody. I was in graduate school and I won't say what the job was because, you know, we don't want to stereotype. But somebody I was talking to someone who had a job and I said, so what do you want to do after this? And they were so puzzled by the question because what they were doing was like what they plan to keep doing. Mm-hmm. Right. So it it took me a minute to realize that, like, why my question was strange to them. Right. Because I had imagined you could not be content with this. Like you must have another vision. And that was not the case. Mm-hmm. Right. So we have to be able to, uh, you know, first we have exposure. Because, you know, sometimes people aren't dreaming another dream because they don't know another dream exists. Mm. Right. So it is important to let them know of like what is possible 
And sometimes they know it exists, but they think it's just for other people. And so um, for them to be able to have conversation with people who maybe had similar challenges, but were able to overcome them in some ways, uh, to, to be able to have permission for that. The other piece is they may have a dream, but it's a different dream. Mm, mm. Right. And so to go back to like, what was the dream before you were talked out of it? Mm. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so what if, what if they don't like the work of your dream, but they don't, all, they also don't like the problems of their reality. Like, is there a middle ground? Because I've experienced like, and it's deep that you said, it, cause I'm just like, wow, that, that's deep because it's like sometimes you're encouraging them because it's like, I see this for you. I see this for you. Right. right. But that's not what they ever told me or told us that that's what they wanted. But they right. just telling us that they don't want their problems that they have in their life. And I'm like, here's a solution. Here's a dream that doesn't those problems don't exist yeah. when you're doing mm-hmm. it. And it's mm-hmm. like, ah, I don't like that dream. I just still don't like these problems. But I, I don't want that solution. Like, that's not the dream for me. And that's right. deep because in my mind, it's like. If you hated the problem so much, you would jump at the first dream that got rid of the problem. Or maybe oh, not. Or exactly. You don't right? hate the problem that much. Well, because the dream is a bigger problem. Well, yeah. it may be that I don't hate the problems that much, or it may be that this just isn't my dream, but I'm but I need another dream. Mm. Right. So the one you're describing doesn't motivate them, doesn't awaken them. They don't get excited to see themselves in that. So there are other dreams. It doesn't have to be like your dream or a stick with your problems. So we need to think about some other dreams. They have like some um, online surveys for like careers or to know like what's your skill set or based on your personality, what are some things you might be good at? Um, so they may need to expand the possibilities so that it's not either or there's there's more choices what is a lie that we often tell ourselves that you that you might commonly find um that that in in just listening to people and and talking with different patients and clients like that we tell ourselves that it's just like not true and what would you if you could tell somebody like Re rewire their brain and tell them a truth that they that is true but they have not yet accepted like that they are powerless or, or something that's constantly that you find being a repeated cycle. What, what is something that we're telling ourselves that um, and a lot of people find to be telling themselves that's just not sure. True? So one of the lies is that everybody else has it together, but me. Mm. Right. And especially if you're on social media, Right. Because people post their best days and sometimes even their fake best days. <laughs> so we have what we call compare despair. Right. Mm-hmm. So like everybody's in a relationship. Everybody has happy, healthy children. Everybody is like on their way up. Everybody learned new skills in the pandemic. Everybody. Yeah, everybody, everybody. I'm the only one scrolling on my phone at 3 a.m. under the covers. And it's like, no, you're not, <laughs> you're not, you're not the only one. So that uh, shame and secrecy keeps us uh, locked in and burdened uh, because we think the feeling that we have is more rare than mm-hmm. it actually is. Mm-hmm. That, um, and it's not to say everyone has lived the same life, but the emotional response to that many people have felt and so to know we're we're not alone in that it makes me think about how a lot of our agitation comes from like comparison and it's not the actual situation that we're in because oftentimes when i hear about other people's pro or like obstacles or problems Mm -hmm. like it makes me like man i went wrong that the wrong way i was really just agitated because i was like this is not life and then to hear that this is life like this is common and it's mm-hmm. like, oh, I felt better. I really felt bad because I thought that this wasn't something that was happening somewhere else. Like uh, it was the it was the comparison in my mind, right. the internal comparison that made it seem so unbearable. Because it's just like yeah. once I noticed somebody else was going through, I'm like, oh, this is not so bad. I could actually grow here. I could actually work. Yeah. 
but I just felt like this wasn't life, you know? Right. How right. do we know what life is? Like, mm-hmm. do you feel like maybe the disconnection between generations or maybe just people in general has created like a misrepresentation of life? Is that something that's like new? Cause I hear people talk about that all the time. I'm like, how did older generations deal with this? Like, or right. was there like some sort of, some sort of better line of communication. Cause you know, even yeah. going back to the motherland, you got the griots that passed down the history of generation yeah. to generation, but I felt like we kind of lose that in modern times. Yeah. So I'm going to say, you know, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think, unfortunately, even if we look across the generations, there's been a lot of uh, silencing and secrets you know, so when we were grow, you know, growing up, it's like you don't tell family business, right? Mm-hmm. Don't talk about that outside of the house. So, you know, don't tell anybody. And so, you know, we have that on one end of it. On the other end of it, those who are in faith communities, we used to have a called a testimony service, right? Where people would like get up and tell these horrific things that God helped them to survive, right? So Uh, There have been certain mediums that we have carved out certain pathways in which it was acceptable for us to tell our stories. You know, part of that is hip hop. Right. If you dissect a lot of older hip hop lyrics, it was like I went through this. I went through this. I went through this and I'm still number one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like my friend was shot. I was locked up. I was this. I was that. And I'm still the greatest. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was the trauma and resilience and trauma and resilience and affirmation and trauma, right? Um, So uh, there have been some ways in which we have broken silence and shame. And I think uh, in this generation, people are doing it more and more, sometimes to the family's outrage because people are sharing like all their business on social media and the family is like, what are you doing, right? Why are you, why are you uh, telling people our, our business? Um, but there is, um, I will say, the cultural tradition of like community and family. Mm-hmm. And there was a research study done where young Black men were the group most likely to say like they didn't feel they had anybody. Mm. Right. So if you don't feel you have, let's say not even your family, if you don't feel like there is a community that cares about you, that's invested in you, that's a part of what people say we lost, you know, with uh, one of the things we lost with integration is sometimes you're having teachers or members of the community that don't see you as brilliant, that mm. don't see you as our hope in our future. And so, um, being able to create community and people do that in different ways, creating organizations or, you know, creating clubs or what have you, uh, faith communities. But that is one of the things that we lost and one of the things that we can reclaim. Mm. I, I, I had like two last questions I, and, and one of them just came to me right now. I wanted to ask you, what do you feel like is a common misconception of therapy that, or a reason why, um, especially as a, I, I can only speak for our community, the black community, um, why we, there's a, like a sense of apprehension to like go to therapy, <clears throat> what, what do you, especially with, I mean, younger people, I, I see it in my age demographic as well, but I yeah. feel like it's getting a lot better. It's getting a lot better. Um, right. what do you feel like is that an immediate apprehension? Like, yeah. Like, so, you know, the myth, the common myths are, Um, you have to be quote unquote crazy to need to go to therapy because you should just talk to your friends Mm -hmm. and talking to a friend is not the same thing. You should have friends, but friend, friend and therapist, a mental health professional is not the same thing. A second one is that's for white people. Another one is that's for rich people. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think because people didn't, for the most part, grow up seeing the people they respect use it, then it's not um, what they think of, Mm. you know? So growing up, I was a pastor's daughter. So people would come talk to the minister, 
Now, your grandparents or whoever wouldn't think anything bad about that. They would say like, oh, yeah, go talk to pastor. Right. Um, So we often do what we have seen. So if you haven't seen someone do it, it's like trying something different. You don't know, like, what is that going to be? And then I will say some people had experiences with mental health professionals that were not culturally attuned. And so if they said something wrong or did something that was problematic, then they generalize and think that's what all of them would do, or that's what all of them would say. You know, one of the common associations people make is those are the people who come to take your kids away, Hmm. right? Because if social workers get a report about child abuse and the child isn't safe in the home and so they're removed, then that is some people's then affiliation of like, stay away from them because they'll take your kids, Mm -hmm. right? And the reality actually is, you know, the priority in uh, states is usually family unification. So they are, you know, first line of action, unless something very severe has happened, is usually that the parents will be given therapy, right? Or have to go to parenting classes or something like that. Um, And then even if they are removed, there's the option of, is there another relative they can stay with while this person gets on their feet? Uh, And then, you know, work if if it is so desired to work towards uh, reunification. But most of the people in therapy, most Black people in therapy have not had to deal with that issue. But that is the one that people are most aware of. And and that's so true because it makes me think about... um, First time I went to therapy as a child, um, it was like it was weird. I, my dad had passed away when I was 10 and we had all all the children, all of me and my brothers and sisters went to therapy. And it was just I, I didn't feel a connection. You know, it was it was it didn't feel it, it didn't yeah. feel safe. You know, it felt yes. like somebody was interrogating me, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I think it was a cultural thing as well. Yes. Um, and I think that's more so what it was. Uh, I'm used to when I'm talking to older people, it to be a certain type of way, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with my granny and, and different older mm-hmm. uh, women, especially because my therapist was a woman. I was used to a certain type of empathy, you know, and um, I yeah. wasn't receiving that perhaps because the women that I was talking to in my family weren't therapists. So maybe they were a little bit, you know, more empathetic, but I don't know. No, uh, that the therapist should be empathetic. <laughs> yeah, especially just, you know, if they're talking to a child, a child who's just had a major loss So that is, uh, I'm glad you're raising the example because not all therapists are the same, Mm -hmm. but some people may think like, oh, they don't care about you, but they encountered one who didn't feel like they cared, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Do you feel like uh, another piece could be that, like you said, that secrecy piece of, especially with like child therapy, because it's like family doesn't want you to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, and the child is he's probably the most or she's probably he or she is probably the most likely to, you know, be like, all right, this is what's going on. This is what I'm experiencing. Do you think that could be like? A- I think it creates a direct tension mm. that the family has given a message. Don't talk about us. Mm. And the whole first session is called an intake session where they ask a bunch of questions. <laughs> I think so, that's probably what it was. I think that's probably, probably what it yeah. was for me. And it felt like an interrogation. Yes. she's good. And that's one of the things people miss. The biggest predictor for if therapy is successful is the relationship. They call it rapport. Mm. So, you know, often people are so busy trying to get through these zillion questions. They haven't like taken the time to build a relationship. So now mm. the kid doesn't want to come back. Right. But it's like, yeah, you went through your 50 million questions, but for what? Mm. So, yeah, that's a a cultural piece of relationship is more important than the task. That just healed my life because I'm like, that gave me a lot of clarity that because I'm like, I didn't understand what it was. Right. What was she doing? That's deep because I'm like, I thought I was just being interrogated. I'm like, I don't really feel like loved right yes. now. I feel like somebody cares about me. I feel like That's somebody's right. interrogating me right extracting, now. Extracting information, an interrogation, all of those things. And I wanted me to go uh, back. And you know, I, just, I, can't, I just can't. Right. I don't, yeah, doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. I, I did want to ask you lastly um, if you could sum up in, in one word or a few words, what would you call this phase in your life right now? 
I would call uh, this phase soaring. Yeah, I <laughs> I have been in earlier seasons of my life when I was in survival mode mm. or like trying to navigate or trying to heal. And um, I'm in a season where I am uh, being myself. And when you are yourself, then you can just... Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate you for just going with us today and gracing us with your presence, just spreading oh. some gems, jewels. Like I, like I said, I feel like my life is healed now. I just oh, especially that question that I had about my dream because I've been wondering about this dream that I've been having. Yes. Oh uh, well, thank you for having me, and I love the question. So uh, thoughtful and insightful, and so many blessings to your audience and community. And I'm just just grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm humbled to have you on. I really appreciate it. And I know the audience will as well. Make sure y'all tune in next week for another episode. And we really appreciate everybody for tuning in. This is Dr. Tamar Ahmad, the poet. And we will see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>